Good morning. My name is Solomon Ferris. I'm the director of student ministries here at Northminster Church. We want to welcome you to our service this morning. Um, if you're new here, you'd like to get connected. Can you hear me all right? You hear me all right? All right, good. Uh, well, if you're new here, you'd like to get connected, you can text connect to 513 or you can scan the QR codes in front of you. Um, the only other announcement we have today is that VBS is coming up in just a few weeks. Um, so we'd love for you guys to sign up for that. Um, that'll be um, a lot of the, the kids ministry team. Um, that'll be June 12th to the 16th. And we're also looking for volunteers. Um, so if you would like to volunteer, you can connect with Sarah or you can sign up online um, under the events tab. So please look out for that as well. Um, and with that, we'll continue with worship. Thank you, Solomon. Uh, good morning, church. Good morning. It, it is uh, good to be with you this morning and to ask for God's presence and God's strengthening uh, to be with us all. My name is uh, Reverend Daniel Meister, and I'm the Director of Congregational Care at Northminster Church, and uh, I'm the person that you would contact if you or someone within your family has any kind of emotional or spiritual needs or physical needs or uh, forthcoming hospitalizations that you would like to make me uh, aware about so that I can be uh, supportive of you and your family and of course uh, Pastor Greg and his work in ministry uh, here at Northminster Church. Um, 
For your ongoing prayer concerns would be the family of uh, Nell Pasley. Uh, Nell passed away, so we want to continue to keep uh, her family in our prayers, uh, ongoing prayers. In addition to, to, the, to the many that we will uh, already have will be um, uh, Jim Frieza and Garner uh, Kopi and Anna Mae Pfeiffer. There are many and several uh, prayer requests that you'll find within your bulletin, and I would encourage you to read those over and uh, apply uh, a, an important part of your prayer time to these needs within our congregational uh, life. Um, in addition to these prayer needs and concerns, we also have a joy, which is today is uh, the children's minister, Sarah Potts' birthday. So we, we just want to put our hands together and wish her a very, we, we oftentimes see Sarah here uh, in the traditional service, and uh, she's doing a great ministry with our young children. And also, did you know it is the big boss's birthday this coming Wednesday? It is Pastor Greg's birthday. Do I have that right, Pastor? It is your birthday this way? I'm not the big <laughs> Well, put your hands together. Pastor Greg's birthday this Wednesday, people. Come on. There we go. Anyway, happy birthday uh, to Sarah and also to Pastor. And we join our hearts in a brief prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are with us and that you guide our hearts in all ways. We thank you for this hour of worship and we pray for all of the unique and particular needs of those that uh, we love, friends and family within the life of our congregation. And we pray for healing and for grace and for understanding as we pray for all of these needs. And also the joyfulness that uh, comes in celebrating another year of life. So continue to uh, attend to us and be present for us as we sing and pray and praise this morning. In Jesus' loving name we pray, amen. Let us be called into worship. Fear not, I am the first and the last and the living one. I died and behold, I am alive evermore. Because I live, you will live also.
Let us pray. Great and glorious God, the great I am who raised his son from the tomb and conquered triumphant over death, forgiving all of our sins and transgressions through the sacrifice of your Lord and Jesus, who died upon the cross. Hear our loud hallelujahs in praise of your victory. You who created all things beautiful and good and saw that we would stray and be in need of redemption, sent your son to be an example to us in life and through his victory over death, we are saved. We humbly come before you asking you to protect those who would keep us safe from harm and to rescue us from a world gone mad, from war and rumors of war, from tragedy and heartache, from anarchy and acts of sedition, from poverty and hunger. Comfort us in this time of uncertainty and bring us hope in a tomorrow filled with unbridled blessings. And so we ask you to be among us in our morning worship and throughout the coming week, reminding us that you are God as we pray the prayer that he taught to his disciples saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
as we do every Sunday, we come to our God and say, we need you. We need you to cleanse us. We need you to forgive us. It's not about guilt. It's about possibility. Because as forgiven children of God, we can do so much more for him. We are so much more available to him. We can hear his voice so much more clearly. So lean into the possibilities as we pray together the prayer of confession. Heavenly Father, we come to you confessing our sin. One thing you asked of us, that we love others as you have loved us. This request has proven to be behind us. We pray for your forgiveness and mercy. We ask you to create in us a new heart so that we could come before you with a genuine spirit of worship. Grant that we trust in your promises so that by faith we might find the will, courage, and strength to follow well. We pray in the name of our living Lord, Jesus Christ. Amen. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. And what is that good news? the children of God greet one another with the peace of Christ. ascended to heaven, and as promised, he has sent to his disciples and believers the Holy Spirit to fill them up and to send them forth to spread the news to all the world. Peter and John find themselves at the steps of a temple, and next to that, those steps, there is a man 
who is lame, and he has been lame from birth. In the name of Jesus, they heal him, and as witness, all of the crowd was witness to them, including the Sadducees and the elders. Being late in the day, they don't know what to do with Peter and John because they, they don't understand. They're befuddled. So they put them in jail overnight, and in the morning they have a forum. And during that forum, they can't find any reason to condemn them. They admit that they are uneducated, but they speak eloquently and they speak with authority. And so they release them, and that is what brings us to this particular scripture, Acts 4, chapters 23 and 24, and later 29 through 31. After they re were released, they went to their friends and reported what the chief priest and the elders had said to them. When they heard it, they raised their voices together to God and said, Sovereign Lord, who made the heavens and the earth, the sea and everything in them, and now, Lord, look at their threats and grant to your servants to speak your word with all boldness while you stretch out your hand to heal. And signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. When they prayed, they placed the place in which they were gathered together was shaken. And they were all filled in the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God with boldness. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God.
Good morning. Wasn't last week awesome? You know, Mike came up with a, a motto. I thought it'd be kind of fun, aspirational motto. Easter every Sunday. <laughs> now, this room was full and it brought back memories to tons of people. I got a lot of um, emails with people attempting to open champagne and eat cookies, you know. That was great. You celebrated. It's Easter. And life uh, continues. Easter doesn't mean we pretend the valleys don't exist. Easter means we're not alone in the valleys. We have a living Lord who's doing great work. Great work that happened beginning this morning. I mean, we had 10 folks join the church. I thought it was nine, it was 10. And they bring eight children with them. So that's 18 new bodies, new souls. And so, you know, that's what God is doing. We can't make that happen. That's like... We can dis discourage that from happening. We can neglect, um, just like, you know, I love my lawn. You know, I, I got four bags, you know, little Kroger bags of dandelions out of my yard yesterday. That's a big yard, so, but, you know, I could have let them grow, you know. You know, you can neglect things, and... And so we can't stand in the way of God, I suppose. But um, God is working, and that is exciting. So um, anyway, anyway, I'm thrilled. I'm happy. It's been a good, good week. But, you know, now Pasley had, a, had her service last week. I mean, things still happen. That's why we have to say, this isn't about, you know, Easter isn't about making everything disappear that's uncomfortable. It's about knowing that we have a living Lord who walks with us through the good and the bad of life. Now we're starting a new sermon series. Hey, Chris, I don't have a clicker up here, so I'm going to tell you when to move the slide forward, okay? How about right now? There we go. Bold is our sermon series, and... Um, uh, I thought, what's more bold than uh, a little cup of uh, espresso with coffee beans uh, scattered at its base? And so the sermon title is Unflinching Prayer. But before we get into the text that Gary read, I want to uh, address just the word bold. Because I found out when I uh, taught this in a Bible study that people hear the word bold and think different things. Like some people, some personalities think of bold as dangerous, reckless, imprudent. And so why would we preach on boldness if that's what boldness was? I did just a little bit of study. I thought boldness would probably be more common in the Old Testament than the New because it's kind of an Old Testament feel, you know, gird up your loins, get ready. Not the case. Boldness comes up, you know, about 70% of the time um, in the New Testament, about 30% of the time in the Old Testament. It's far more of a New Testament word, bold. It's almost always associated in the New Testament with one act, proclaiming, proclaiming the gospel, almost always. You can look it up, get a little, you know, get yourself a concordance, look up the word bold, check out the passages. You will almost always find proclaiming the gospel. In our passage, it said, when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken. That's never happened to me, but I'd love that. 
It was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God with boldness. So they prayed for boldness and they exhibited boldness. They knelt and they acted and they did a few things in between that we'll talk about. What's important to say is in the Bible, boldness isn't this virtue of courage. We all have different virtues. And if it's just the virtue of courage, you, you either have it or you don't. You're either bold or you're not, which is uncomfortable, you know, to preach. Sorry, only 10% of you are bold, and so I'm talking to the 10% that have that virtue. I don't know if this is good news or bad news, but that's not the kind of boldness that the New Testament or Luke in this passage is talking about. So it's not courage in general. It's not foolish bombast either. When the disciples speak with boldness, you almost always see fruit. Fruit. Like just before this passage, Gary told us, Peter had healed the lame man and then had proclaimed boldly the word of God and then got arrested and then proclaimed the word of God boldly to the religious leaders and the political leaders and then was warned to never say anything in the name of Jesus again, to which they rashly said, I think we will. You know, it's up to you to decide whether we should believe God or you, honor God or you, but we think God is who we need to be honoring. So, as a result of that preaching, 5,000 people came to faith. And in the previous count, it was 3,000. But Luke tells us it was 3,000 men. So we don't know if that was just a way of saying people or if there were men and their wives and their children. This time it's 5,000. So, I mean, the church could be 15,000 by this time, depending how they counted back then. If they were just talking to husbands, then... It's probably somewhere around 10,000. But if those numbers, if those numbers only represented husbands, then, then it is at 10,000. If it represented families, my. It's kind of like what I said. We took 10 new members, but they bring eight children with them. You know, I count children. I just, I kind of like them. They make me happy. But anyway... Foolish bombast never has results. You know people like that. You don't want them to come to your house for Thanksgiving. You know, they always have opinion. It's very loud. And they're, they're always right. And it makes us uncomfortable. And so, big surprise, it doesn't bear any fruit. People take them off their Thanksgiving list. So, that's not what this is. We're not talking about a personality trait. Really, what we're talking about is a gift of God. So Chris, if you could forward it, yeah. For God did not give us a spirit of cowardice, but rather a spirit of power and love. I love that power is held together with love. Because power without love is a bit scary and of self-discipline. The important thing I want you to note is in the first line. Give is in there. We often think of boldness or courage or competence as something that we're born with, a virtue. 
And we see people who exhibit confidence in powerful ways. And we, you know, if we're not part of that 10% who have that, you know, we kind of say, gosh, I wonder what that would be like to be that confident. But this is not something we find within us. This boldness is a gift of God. This boldness comes with prayer and the filling of the Holy Spirit. And it's purposeful. So you might say it's a particular kind of boldness that has to do with becoming a faithful witness to Jesus Christ just like the choir sang to us. Go ye therefore into all the world. Proclaim good news. We're talking about a gift from God that any one of us could receive. So you think, oh, I'm not good enough, I'm not holy enough. Well, neither am I. Any one of us can receive it. You might think, I'm not old enough, I'm not young enough. Neither am I. The gift is available to all. Because God does not give a spirit of cowardice, but a spirit of power and love and self-discipline. Let's move a slide. If you want this boldness, maybe this text shows us how. This is so strange. Maybe this text is telling us we're the strongest when we're on our knees. So in our culture, we don't think of being on your knees as a posture of strength. We think of it as a posture of weakness. But here's a church that is on its knees. Almost the very first thing they do is on their knees. Peter and John come back from jail. They probably don't know what to expect from the church. But they report what happened in the jail. How in the jail they were threatened and commanded to say nothing in the name of Jesus ever again, and how they said, we're, we're choosing to listen to God and not you. They didn't hide the fact that they were being civilly disobedient. They just declared it. But because of all the people who came to faith and the news about the lame person being healed, who had been there for 40 years... They really didn't feel like they had the informal authority to do anything. If they arrested him, a lot of people would be crying foul. So even the leaders back then were moved by the popular opinion. But right after they give the report... And this is what I love about this passage. It's really surprising. Everything in it is surprising. Right after they give the report, it says in verse 24, when they heard it, the report, they raised their voices together to God. So this is surprising too. It wasn't just Peter or John. It was everybody was praying. That doesn't say they got on their knees. I'm just using it uh, figuratively. Getting on our knees is a thing of the heart and maybe the body. The spirit is necessary. The physical act, less so. But the whole church is crying out to God, lifting their voices together. I find that surprising because in my experience, I would think that if I got arrested and came back to the elders, I don't think the elders would be lifting their voices in prayer. I think they'd be interrogating me. What are you doing? You represent the good name of Northminster. We got to make a plan. We need a lawyer. 
they prayed. I'm not necessarily saying the other option is bad. It seems prudent. But they prayed. They knelt. They knelt because what they needed, they didn't have. They had to ask God for it. Oh, to be a church that kneels as much as it plants. Can you imagine? We just said Easter. He conquered death. What could he do for a church that kneels? One more slide. You know this one from Paul in Philippians. Don't be anxious about anything. But in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. It's really all over the Bible. It's not bold of me to call you to prayer. There's a second thing we do. We remember, and we've got to go one more. Oh, you're good now. So much of the Christian life is about remembering. If I had to say five essentials, it would be one of them. Remember. Remember to remember if you're like me. Put a string around your wrist. Put a, one of those uh, stretchy bands that say, um, I'm a wonderful person or something like that. Um, just remember. And how they remember is in their prayer. So you know how everybody has a way to pray. I mean, I was talking to Helen and, and she prays, dear God, like a letter. And then if you hear Jane Whalen, she prays, Father of us all. I used to pray Heavenly Father, which I really liked because um, uh, my father uh, had to be absent a lot of my life. I'm not blaming or anything like that. He did it to provide for us. But Heavenly Father meant there was someone fatherly in my life that was still there. So I like that. Now it's all loving, all mighty God, because I love that mix of love and power. It's kind of like Lincoln, a man of steel and velvet. That's what Sandberg said in his poem. No, it was in a speech to Congress. But anyway, remember to remember. How they pray is how I've never prayed. I don't think I've ever said, sovereign Lord, maker of heaven and earth and the sea, and all that is in them. But they're in a situation of vulnerability. So they're leaning into the aspects of God that they need. They need a God who can create planets and solar systems and galaxies and the universe. They need a God who can create the life that lives in those places on this earth. On the land and in the sea and in the air. They needed a God who would be bigger than the religious authorities. And good news, they got that God. Just a side note, um, my friend Greg Ellis hates journaling, hates it. And I'm not a good journaler, but my wife is. And it is so fun to, when we feel like the day is hard, to read back, you know, look back what was happening five years ago on this date, or 10 years ago, or 20 years ago. But I'm doing this 20th day or 20th year anniversary for the church we planted down in Alabama. I get to preach there. I'm so excited. Um, but we were trying to remember what it was like there. And in, in one journal, uh, when you plant a church, you don't make much money. I'm just, you know, so don't let your children grow up to be church planters. Um, but, um, you know, I mean, I mean, not much at all. And you, you get used to it. And um, it was my, it was just, it could have been this day 20 years ago because um, it was coming up on my birthday and um, Connie was so angry, she wrote in the journal, not at me, well, not directly. 
She wrote in the journal that she was so mad because there was $5.86 in her bank account. And it was my birthday. And she, she just shared that. Turns out, a couple days later when we read about the birthday, it was one of the better ones I've ever had. You just have to remember. And a journal can really help you do that. So Isaiah says we should do it also. And that text is on the next slide. Remember the former things, those of long ago, the things of old. For I am God, and there is no other. I am God, and there is no one like me. That's what they needed. That's what we need. That God, that's singular. There's no God like him. We would say, there's no other God. But we also know we turn all sorts of things into God's. Our bank accounts, our experiences, our relationships. We turn all those things into God. So I'm not so sure there is no other gods, but there's no God like our God. Third thing we do, we ask. They pray, it's surprising, for boldness. If I imagine it, I would imagine people praying for protection or for wisdom or for God to, you know, crush their enemies or something like that. They pray for boldness. I could probably number the times I have prayed a prayer for boldness on one hand. And I could number the times I've heard a prayer for boldness on the other hand. It's just not a common prayer. But that's what this church does. Shares an uncommon prayer and asks for boldness. Now there's boldness in the asking and there's boldness in the coming. Just coming to God. This sovereign Lord. So if we could do the next slide. It's from Hebrews. Let us therefore approach the throne of grace with boldness so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. Now there's a fourth thing we do. We act. We act. You remember how it ended. The room shook and they were filled with the Spirit and they proclaimed the word of God boldly. They acted. Or was it God who acted? Or is it a dance where God and us need to act? But their action is the reason we're here together worshiping God. Because if the early church had failed, there would be no church. So thank God they prayed almost instinctually. You know how instincts are, fight, flight, freeze? It, it doesn't read like a discipline of prayer. You know, they weren't doing their quiet time or their devotions. They were lifting up their voices to God, saying, grant us boldness. We act, or God acts, or we and God act, but things happen. I think of uh, Psalm, I think it's 37, verse 5. Lay your concerns before the God, our God. Trust in him and then act. But it doesn't say that. It says, lay your concerns before God, your vision, your dreams. 
Trust in him, and he will act. It's not just about us. It's about our God. What could God do? So my question for you is, what specific thing, conversation, could you do this week boldly in the name of Jesus Christ? for the further furthering of the kingdom of God. What could you do? Start with prayer. Get on your knees. In that prayer, remember who your God is. Sovereign, creator. He can, he can create the universe. Ask. Tell God what you need to accomplish that work of boldness. And then act. Do it. Do it in love. Do it kindly. Do it lovingly. Don't be bombastic. Don't be arrogant. But act. And it will be Easter every Sunday. I promise. You know, when I think of boldness, there's a lot, you know, it's counter-instinctual. We're about preservation of self. I love that movie. Have any of you seen that movie, We Bought a Zoo? Come on. Someone has seen it. Jerry, thank you. Anybody back here? Anybody raise their hand? Denny? You know, do you remember Denny went, yeah, now I got your attention. When Matt Damon is talking to his, does this work? Are we on? When Matt Damon is talking to his kids about, his son was asking, um, telling him, but he's got an almost girlfriend, and he's scared to death to talk to her. And you remember this? They're in the, they're, the, the tiger is not doing well, and they're in the kind of animal hospital area. And he says to his son, look, all you need is, do you remember this? 20 seconds of insane courage. You don't need to be courageous. You just need 20 seconds of it. That's how he met his wife. He was walking down the street. Sorry, I'm moving. It, you know, I have to worry about cameras now. Um, he's walking down the street. His kids are in this coffee house, kind of diner. And he's trying to tell this, his kids now, the girl and the boy, how he met his wife. And he's, he's walking down. Sally, are you cool with being the wife in this? He's walking down, and he sees this woman through the window in the restaurant. And he just stops. He just stops in his track, which is something like kneeling. And he says, that is the most beautiful woman I have ever seen. And then he reminds himself, I don't need to be courageous. I just need to be courageous for the next 20 seconds. And so he walks in kind of behind her, then comes up from behind, and then, Sally, are you you're okay with this? I'm not going to hug you or anything. And then he says something like, why would a wonderful woman like you want to spend any of your time with me. Now, he's Matt Damon. I don't think he really says that, but he said that to her. And she says, why not? You know, it bore fruit. 20 seconds of courage. So, hey, don't worry about this boldness thing. Pray for boldness. Who knows what will happen? Maybe it'll be Easter every Sunday. Amen. How about we affirm our faith boldly? This, I use the Westminster Confession, which is a pretty rough and tumble confession if you read it. But um, I think this tells us something about our God and how big he is. Please join me. The light of Scripture and of nature declares that there is a God 
who has lordship and sovereignty over all, who is good and does good unto all, and who is feared, or feet be feared, loved, praised, called upon, trusted, and served with all the heart, and with all the soul, and with all the might. Amen. Now let us stand and sing, all hail the power of Jesus' name. You know how sometimes we hear people, or I've probably said it once in my life, or, or a dozen times, I believe in the power of prayer. Have you heard that? So, I only believe in the power of prayer under one condition. Yep. Just. So essentially I'd say no, unless you're praying to our God who made heaven and earth. It's not prayer. It's the God we pray to that is so important. And so I'm just looking back, and I'm sorry I'm doing this, Chris, but you know, Chris is back there. Been battling cancer, chemo. And so he has a cap on in church. Don't give him a hard time for that. He's here. Our God does things. Not everything we pray for. You know, we live and we die. But our God does things and is doing things. So you're going to go out into the world and um, you can go out any sort of way. You can go out kneeling, talking to God. Or you can go out with your head lifted high that you don't need God. You can go out any sort of way. But to do it like they did it, um, 
Well, that's a gift of God. And we need each other for that. At the 9 o'clock service, I said, you know, we're having a, a join the church meeting. If that's a bold step, you're invited. We had it in between service, so I couldn't really do it here. Um, but I want to encourage our new folks, even though we live in an age of not joining, to join. Because we need each other to accomplish big things for our big God. So let's charge each other to leave this place well. Go forth into God's world in peace. Be of good courage. Hold fast to what is good. Return to no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the afflicted. Honor all people. Love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. I pray that you would know the blessings of God, blessings that can go into the deepest, darkest valleys, and blessings that can find their way up to the highest mountaintops. We experience both, and we find you there. I pray that you may know the full richness of God's blessings, the blessings of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen.